Hello and welcome to today's learning lunch. Today we're going, going to talk about no code, especially no code for developers. Does that make sense? Can developers somehow take advantage of no code or is it something for people related to not coding, for example, marketing, sales, product people? We're going to discuss this today with Lilith. Um, but before we start, let me introduce, I'm Sebastian, I'm a co-founder of Tech Leaders Academy. And at Tech Leaders Academy, we are building a community of like-minded people from engineering development, from data, all people who want to grow in their career um, and who want to boost their career through live streams like this, through open spaces and through training. So if you're interested in our offerings, check out tech-leaders.academy. And now we come to our main topic about no code. And for that, I have a great guest with me today. It's Lilith. Lilith is a thought leader on LinkedIn when it comes to no code, especially in the German area. And she is co-founder of Visual Makers. And with, with Visual Makers, uh, she's offering training and enables people from non-tech, from the non-tech world, being able to get into tech and being able to experiment and um, yeah, take advantage of new no code tools. But um, I think she can explain that way better than I can. So it's time to get her on stage. Hello. Lilith. Hi, Sebastian. Happy to be here. Welcome. So I think um, I tried my best to introduce you, but I think you can do that much better. So here's your stage. <laughs> uh, sure. Happy to. Uh, so hi, I'm Lilith. Um, I'm the co-founder uh, and CEO of Visual Makers. And um, you explained it quite well, actually. So uh, Visual Makers um, is a no-code agency. We offer also trainings uh, for for non-technical people, but also for technical people who want to uh, get into no code and automation. Um, we're building a community around that. So uh, we're basically kind of the ecosystem for the um, German speaking market for, for no and low code. Um, we um, present new tools, see which updates there are, um, and try to uh, to give you always the best tools at hand uh, that you need for, uh, for your project. Great. So one thing that I left out is that you're also an agency. So you're not just doing enablement through training. You're also um, basically doing no-code solutions for your uh, customers, right? Yes. So our mission is to was always like from the beginning to democratize tech. Uh, so we're really interested in in enabling more people uh, to to build software, to to build automations for their own daily life, either in business or in private life. Um, so what we do with our agency is also to help founders um, or um, companies who want to innovate, who want to test out uh, like new ideas and so on to, to help to get them started um, with their no-code product. So I think uh, later in, in our talk, we, we get to that, like why it also makes sense, even if you if you have a dev team to, uh, to build with no-code in some cases. Um, so yeah, we, we help various companies um, to get build their products like faster uh, at lower cost. Okay. And what's your background, by the way? Are you a developer? <laughs> no, not at all, actually. <laughs> uh, so my way into tech was actually no code. Um, and I'm a really bad developer. So I, well, I, I tried a few things, right, with basic web development, but um, I'm, I'm more into the, the no code and automation field. So my background is actually, I wanted to, to uh, study acting uh, for quite whole my life, like until I was um, 20 or 22 or so. And then I accidentally stumbled into the startup world. Um, and there I discovered no code and automation tools. And at that time I thought like, okay, every company uses these no code tools i didn't know at the time it was called no code right but like these automation tools um that's what i started with because it makes so much sense because everybody can can do it there's no bottleneck because you only have developers um that can access these these tools so everybody can kind of automate their own process and, and get more efficient um and then i learned quite quickly that that wasn't the case and so i i kind of wanted to spread the word because, you know, no code opened for me such a big world. Like it, I wouldn't have been able to access tech if it wasn't for no code. Right. And um, even to build my own business probably. So um, I really want to spread the world. Like 
uh, of how you can kind of enable or leverage no code to to be enabled to build your own product. Okay, yeah, great. So um, today we're going to talk about how developers actually can take advantage of no code. But before we dive into that topic, I think it's important that we that we define what no code actually is. Can you give us an introduction or like a definition what no code is for you or what no code is basically uh, the the I mean, in, is there a definition of it? Well, I think there are various definitions. So the one that I like to go by is, is um, no code is actually the wrong word because no code doesn't mean no code. Uh, it's just there's a visual layer above the code. So mm -hmm. the code is more accessible. And if you don't want to, then you don't have to, to access the, the code um, ever. Mm -hmm. But if you want to, in most cases, you're able to do that. So um, no code is basically a term that describes various tools, SaaS tools, with which you can build software in any kind of way. If it's apps or, or um, automations or even a form builder or something little like um, authentication plugin or so is mm -hmm. probably also no code. So... Um, it's a kind of wishy-washy term, and it's kind of the new sexy term because no code is new. Uh, no code is pr probably Excel is no code in some way as well. Um, wouldn't call it that now, but um, yeah, it's. I think it's just a sexy marketing term right now. But you mentioned something very important. You mentioned you have a visual interface, right? You yes. ne don't necessarily have code. That's also why you um, named your company Visual Makers. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, okay. Now we have the uh, connection there. Yeah. yeah, that makes totally sense. Maybe we can understand. No, also, I don't know if you if you know the definition of no SQL. It, it's not called no in terms of not. It's actually not only. So it means it's not only SQL. It could be a little bit more. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's probably the right way to, to say it with no code as well. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, not <laughs> only code. Yeah, not only probably. code. Yeah. And Speaking of no code and the definition, especially when we uh, get the definition of not only, what is now the difference to low code, which is also a term that uh, we have come across in the recent years? Yes. So some say that we have to draw a strict line between no code and, and low code and code. Um, I think that doesn't really make sense because um, the question is not what I can build with no code, low code or code, but what is the right tool or the right technology, if you want to, for the the product that I'm building. Uh, uh, yeah, the product that I'm building. So I think that the power lays in the combination um, of these tools. And when you start with no code, you quickly get into low code and then you quickly kind of get into code and then you can dive deeper and become an actual developer. But um, you can also just handle a lot of stuff just with these, like with your, your no-code and low-code um, knowledge. But maybe one difference can be, some say, and I kind of like that, to go from, from the user perspective. So if you have users, um, by example, in HR or marketing or so, that want to automate um, their processes, but they don't have to be developers to, to get that uh, right, right. So um, for them, it makes a lot of sense to build as easy as possible. So we could say, okay, for these um, people, there's no code is, is quite well. But then you have kind of the bridge between where you have to have a little bit of, of technical knowledge, I would say, to access low code tools, because these can get quite complex. And they kind of bridge the gap between no code and, and code. Um, and you have different roles for who can access low code, but both like engineers and um, um, and non techy people can access low code or can learn no code. So uh, low code. So um, I would say it it kind of shifts in between. And there's no strict line mm -hmm. between no code and and low code because if you say like okay, low code is a tool and kind of a visual builder where it can also um, put in custom code, 
then I couldn't name you any any no code tool because basically in every no code tool you can also put in custom code. Mm -hmm. um, some in some cases you can't um, export the code um, in in full, uh, but that, that depends on the tool. So also here, it's not not really a straight answer. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not there are no strict lines, and I totally feel that because. Um, Sarah did this poll yesterday on LinkedIn where she was asking people um, how are they using no code if, or if they face any restriction. And I think the um, answer given the most was that there was missing flexibility um, for the developers. And this is also when I used no code because I love no code, no code I have to admit, because although I'm a developer for almost 20 years, I love to make things simpler. And don't yeah. care that much about deployment and database and connection and that all that stuff. I love to have a simple solution um, that also somebody else could take over without the coding skills. But mm. when I have a lack in flexibility, I often have the chance to add some code, some glue code, some styling, something to make it that flexible that it fits whatever I want to do. Yeah. And I think that's that's very important that. There is no strict line. You have a no-code tool, but it sometimes offers you or gives you the possibility to add your code and um, to yeah adjust what adjust the solution or the recipe that is offered to you. Yeah, definitely, and it it really really depends on the tool. So when we go for full stack tools or or web app tools in in general, right? So you have something like Glide and Softer. Um, like tools that are really easy to use and you can you can build a whole app in literally like 10 minutes uh, like including uh, user login authentication um, and in some databases right um, and but that's not the tool that you want to do like for a fully completely customized uh, version of your your app that you already have in mind right uh, so, uh, it's more for internal tools or when you know, okay, I only need these features and that's enough for me, right? But then we have tools like WeWeb and Bubble and, and Xano, which go more in the low-code direction. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not, you, you won't build an app in 10 minutes on these tools, but you can build much more complex apps with these tools um, and much faster um, than, than you do with traditional code. Um, of course, there are also limits in some way, but they're really open uh, so that you can find not only workarounds, but kind of, by example, use a WeWeb or Bubble as a front end and then have a I know, data heavy algorithm in the back end. And then you, um, yeah, and, and then you have kind of the combination. So it really, really depends on a tool where you have these limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So it depends on the tool in the end, right? It depends. Yeah. It's, it's always it depends. depends on, right? It always depends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got a question for, from uh, Frank. Nice that you're here with us. Um, does it have to be a software uh, SaaS solution? Uh, are there standalone no-code tools? So I think uh, he's referring to what you mentioned, that there's most of the no-code tools are SaaS solutions. But as far as I know, it's not only SaaS, right? Well, there's probably... Uh, the question like, okay, wh what is a SaaS tool? Like in in the end, it's like software as a service. And also if I have like a front end tool that I combine with a back end tool and they're both subscription based, then that's a SaaS model. Um, and also a standalone tools where I pay uh, like X amount uh, of euros or dollars like um, per, per month, then it's also subscription based and it's also kind of a SaaS model. So uh, of course, there are also standalone no-code tools, but I would consider them SaaS as well. Okay, but there are also ways to do it self-hosted? Yeah. So maybe yeah, this is also kind of the answer. Uh, I don't know, for, uh, Frank, if, you're, if that oh. is the answer, tell us or maybe uh, uh, write us again if, <laughs> if we missed out now. Yeah, yeah, especially the ones like where you where you can export the code um, or how, yeah, basically host it on your own servers. But to build, you still have uh, to have the subscription model to have like your your staging or dev environment. 
um, for some tools, but tools like also in automation space, like N8N, you can uh, also host on your own servers and build it in your own products. And that's then technically probably not a SaaS anymore. Yeah, so that's right. Okay. And we got another question. So um, what are the biggest chances that no code opens up apart from automatization? automatization? <laughs> Difficult one. Uh, uh, that's a good one. <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, it's no code is nothing new. Um, and also the the disruptive um, aspect of no code is not the technology. Um, but what is disruptive about it is that so many more people can access it. So when we're talking about, uh, by example, engineers, developers, uh, and so on, um, developing code, and you probably all know the situation where someone from marketing or someone from product, HR, whatever, any any other department that doesn't code uh, comes to you and wants to have something fixed or something built, and there's always this bottleneck of developers. And in a world like where uh, I think, um, 95% or or 89%, so, something like that, of people can read, write, and count, but only 0.3% uh, of people in the world can code. And we have a huge demand on apps, uh, internal tooling, automation um, over the next years, and it will grow like rapidly over the next uh, few years. And we all already have a shortage um, of, um, of developers and engineers who can build these things. And it also doesn't really make sense that engineers build everything themselves because um, then still you you can't have access like to all the people that, that could um, kind of iterate it, use it, um, mm -hmm. update it and so on. And also if I'm working in marketing and then I tell um, uh, a developer colleague that I want to have this and that built. If I don't speak tech, even no code tech, right? Then there's a huge gap in communication. Mm -hmm. And when I understand what is the basic principle and what are the concepts of a database, what is a re relational database? What is an API? Like how can I access information? That's a huge step forward um, to how we communicate, how we work together and how we build ideas. So when we talk about founders, by example, right? If you don't have a technical co-founder years ago, you really had a problem because either you needed a lot of money um, to pay developers or agencies or so to build your product, or you invested in something that just happened to be on paper and nobody knew like, is, is this idea worth it to, to put money in or not? So once for founders, of course, you build faster, you build more efficient, you build, build at lower costs. And for internal teams, like internal tooling, everything like that is not the USP of your product. Um, by example, every web app needs a authentication, um, needs a, some need a customer portal. Um, they need some kind of chat or payment solution or something like that. Everything you connect to it, um, and there's also the, the combination aspect, right? So that you have a code base and then you kind of build around it everything that doesn't have to be coded with no code. Um, so I see the biggest biggest chance in enabling more people um, to create digital products. Yeah, so now this is a perfect segue, by the way, to, to dive deep into our main question. So now you have some advantages of no code and low code tools. From the whole ecosystem we have a huge demand we don't have enough people uh, dealing with all these kind of yeah challenges and um i mean we both from germany we know that uh, we lag behind when it comes to digital things uh, to some extent and now is the question how can developers take advantage of this and why should they yeah yeah that's a that's a really good question and i get it a lot actually so um i think um, also here, the biggest chance is um, in enabling the people around you also to build with tech. So um, the main point is focus. 
So if you're able to focus on the things that really need to be coded, like the data heavy things, the, the algorithm things, the really, really um, complex database structures and, and so on, right? Um, there will always be demand for code uh, in some way, uh, at least, I guess. Um, but if you can enable like everyone around you to, um, to, to, even if it's just through APIs, right? If you have your core solution that you can focus on as a developer and have tools at hand, because in the end, no code and low code is just another tool in your toolbox mm -hmm. that can help you to develop, a, to develop faster, more efficient, um, and so on. Um, so that's a huge, huge benefit and an add-on. And it's not about um, this or that, right? It's not about like, you have to choose this over that. Mm -hmm. It's more about uh, how can you com combine these two technologies? Mm -hmm. For example, if you have a lot of integrations, it makes total sense to just use something like Make or uh, Zapier maybe, or N8N um, automation tools to connect different APIs with each other. You don't have to code that yourself because nobody, you know, it's not the USP of your product to code that yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that's an example. Uh, and I got, got many more. I could go on on this like like forever. Uh, yeah. But I, w I think the, the basic sentence is kind of like, it's another great tool in your mm -hmm. toolbox. To give people an impression what it looks like, you were just talking about make and automation. We got this question. We could maybe show this to our audience what it looks like, right? Sure. So let us share your screen. So you can explain us a little bit how make w works basically and how it looks. Yeah, uh, I'd love to. Make is uh, actually one of my favorite tools. Um, so you have this open canvas here um, where you have these little, little bubbles. Um, and what you do is basically connect different apps with each other. And you can think of these bubbles as little front ends to API uh, endpoints. Uh, so I, by example, I have here uh, an automation um, where I have uh, a form a formula uh, with a form with a tally. Um, and so uh, by example, customer support or a product update. I think that's actually a product update, uh, what I have here. So. Um, it's a it's a demo account for workshops I use, um, and um, so I get my my form input. Then I have a webhook here, um, and the data from my form input I can open it just real quick. Oh, I don't have a webhook connected, um, but then I'm going to show you another another scenario. Um, let me go back when my screen loads. <laughs> So I'm going to show you real quick how to create a new a new scenario. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, that's really slow. That <laughs> <laughs> I didn't consider this. Um, well, basically, you have kind of the, this canvas, and then you choose your your system that you want to connect. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a huge list of apps. Um, that you that you can choose from, uh, so I think it's like two thousand or something like that. Wow! Um, and um, or you can just uh, search for it. So, uh, by example, um, we could go for uh, Airtable. Uh, that's a visual database. Uh, we just search for it, and um, then it. Normally, it's also quicker. It's probably because of the studios. <laughs> it's now. probably because we're streaming right now. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, well, that wouldn't go for the myth like no code is super slow. Uh, <laughs> so it's normally faster, believe me. <laughs> um, OK, it's not loading. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Uh, so but basically, you just connect these bubbles. And you have like little forms where you map the data from your former module. And you can really get quite complex um, with with make uh, so build uh, big automations for um, 
I know, document management, um, for customer lead management, um, or, or lead generation, or lead enrichment, by example, right, when we are in marketing, but also for product updates or, or internal product automations. So, um, yeah, I wish I could get you a bit of better idea, but if you want to check it out, then uh, you can... Um, you can sign up for our uh, free no code fundamentals course. Um, there you kind of get your first steps into make and, and uh, get to know the tool a little better. But the magic of make and other automation tools is basically you have, we have APIs of all um, interesting web services anyway. So basically what we do, we have with make the chance to connect these APIs in an intelligent way. Um, to make workflows out of it that are scheduled on a certain time or um, on a certain event. And we don't have to go down to code because we have this visual interface. Yeah, exactly. And in my opinion, I think it's it's quite powerful to have something like this because I don't need to care about um, in which, what language I write my code if I have the packages downloaded uh, where to deploy it. Um, there are so many things to consider and that take time that it's often much easier, especially if you have like basic cases that are not uh, dealing with like terabytes of data, for example, that you do something like this and um, take advantage of uh, writing less code. Yeah, definitely. And I also get a lot the question, like, but I'm faster when I build it myself with code, like for, especially for little applications that we build for, um, other departments, right? If we are in a company um, uh, company field or uh, to build um, like a whole new product. Um, but um, the what you always have to consider is, are you the bottleneck in the end, right? Like who's the bottleneck in the end? So if you build it yourself and yeah, maybe you are faster, but then you are also always the one maintaining that or if, the engineering department, right? And it sometimes it makes so much more sense if the people who actually own the process or mm -hmm. the KPI or or whatever they're building um, to be able to update and iterate because they know their process way better than anybody else uh, anyway. Yeah, and I have a perfect example of this. It's many years ago when um, I was working with different companies and they were including website trackers. And the website tracker that everybody knows is Google Analytics, uh, and they integrate it directly. But then marketing came by and they wanted to have other trackers and they wanted to include ads and stuff like that. And then Google Tag Manager came out. It doesn't necessarily need to be Tag Manager. There are like other Tag Managers, but this was the option to have this one tag included. And then marketing, sales, whoever was able to have a no code interface, basically a visual interface to include all the tags that they want to include. And the develop, de development department had no nothing to do with it anymore because this yeah. one tag was included and they could do whatever they want. Yeah, definitely. And this was like the early encounters of myself with like no code and the idea, which is really fascinating to me because I think it's necessary to have these tools because you mentioned the challenges already. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, another thing that comes to my mind, I heard some developers and engineers saying that the term no code developer is a contradiction because no code and developer together and you see open positions for that, right? Yeah, we, we have one, uh, some of our on our website as well. <laughs> so what is a no code developer? <laughs> uh, so I had, funny enough, I had the question like on my LinkedIn uh, before as well, like how do we want to call them? because it's kind of a new role, right? It's you yeah. build software and you, if you take the word development, it's, it, I mean, it is development, right? Mm -hmm. It's just another language if you want to. And it doesn't mean necessarily that there's no code involved. So it, it's kind of this in between thing. So I would say there are few different roles. So you have like a no code operator who who works with automation tools and so on. Then you have maybe a no-code builder or maker mm -hmm. who creates internal tools like with these visual tools, right? With no-code if you want to. 
but doesn't really touch code. Like when it's get more, it gets more complex or more individual than more customized, then then they're probably not the right ones. And then we have like the no code developers. So I would say these are people who develop products with no code. And that's where we have no code developer. Okay. I mean, that that's fine for me. If you compare to a software developer, it says is a prefix software developer. And in this case, no code, because you're taking advantage of no code or no code tools. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it also probably means that you're, um, you're more, that is more accessible to learn, right? Um, mm -hmm. When we have topics like to make software development more inclusive, like not only more women in tech and more, um, uh, yeah, kind of side groups in tech and, and so on. So it's more accessible when it has the term no code because it seems like, okay, I can learn this. And, and it's not like I have this this image. I I, I, I should have uh, showed it here as well. Like this image where you have a, a screen where you have on one side like code and on the other side, no code. And I had one comment underneath it who said like, Hey, this on the on the left side, the code that kind of looks like, hi, ah, I don't know where I'm starting. Like I can break things and I don't understand. And on the on the right side was like, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of more hands on and and more accessible. It's about the accessibility. I think that's quite important if we consider that there are many boot camps around, many people doing lateral entries in a tech career, having these tools and um, getting it, having it more accessible, as you said, right. And yeah. Sarah mentioned something. Uh, she's more from she sees everything more from the data side, and uh, no code developer reminds her of the prompt engineer who is acting a lot with the Gen AI tools, but not necessarily coding own AI models. That's right. So uh, we have similar comparisons there, and also prompt engineer. That's a perfect example. Um, you see that you see that position is open. And then people are asking, why do you need a prompt engineer? It's natural language, right? Because you can just write with natural language. But it's it's special in a way. You need to know how yeah. to how to make a good prompt. Yeah, definitely. And you have to understand like how uh, under which, what is the model? Like how can I make it better? If you you know, we probably all had a situation where we kind of tried ChatGPT and Co. in in the beginning, and was like. Okay, that's quite cool, but then we didn't really use it until we figured out like, okay, I have to use tone of voice and I have to get really specific and mm -hmm. I have to have that and that and that in place. And then it really, it's really fun and it's really useful actually. So I think the same goes kind of for no code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see also a lot of similarities because I see both as a tool, especially when it comes to product development, both are new abstractions or new tools you can use to um, yeah, develop your products faster or better or more secure. It depends on what you want to do with it, but both are very powerful tools in my opinion. Yeah, and especially like the combination is like, uh, there's where, where the real magic lies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we prepared something because uh, we have a, a small myth busting prepared. We oh, nice. actually collected five myths and uh, we want to bust them because um, we heard often that people say, no code for developers, that doesn't make sense. Um, you cannot develop real world apps with this. So I would like to start from myth one to myth five and uh, basically yeah, discuss with you what's all about that myth. Is it true or false or something in between? So, sure, let's, let's, go. let's start with the first one, with the first, with the most obvious, I think. So, no code cannot build real world apps, uh, especially if you consider like something visual, as you said, or other would say drag and drop or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, that's entirely not true. Uh, so, there are lots of really successful running businesses um, or um, apps uh, that are published with. Uh, sometimes millions of users uh so uh that's really not true we have a we have a great uh quite a list of um of businesses running on on no code uh we can also try out like what is what is possible so i was uh, just in paris at the no code uh, conference um and there um 
one of the, the speakers um, uh, presented uh, what they just had built with AI and no code. Uh, that was pretty impressive. It was a social network uh, for bots. So mm -hmm. there are only bots allowed in the social network, but it works kind of like Facebook. You have a chat, you have a, um, you have a feed, you have profiles, uh, you have different groups. And um, the bots were kind of answering to each other and it's just completely autonomous and you can create new bots and then it's generated like, you know how AI works, right? So mm -hmm. um, it's it's generating all these bots and there are, I'm not sure how many thousands are now on, on this platform, but it's really populating. So um, I think that is an example for, to show like what you can do already kind of with, uh, with no code. And they're probably, well, there are limitations of course, mm -hmm. um, sometimes in, um, but it really depends on how you build because it, it, it's, I mean, it's the same principles for it, that go for coding as well, right? If you build a shitty database structure, then your app is going to be really slow, right? And that's the yeah. same for no code. So um, it's, yeah, uh, it's it, you can build real world apps uh, with no code. We're running entirely of no code uh, on no code. Um, okay, so maybe we could dive deeper there. So what? Uh... What kind of apps do you have? Do you have the website Visual Makers? Uh, what else are you running on no-code? Well, we run a lot of internal tools, by example, on no-code, and also what we build up for our customers. Um, are, uh, they are we're focused on, on web apps. Uh, so um, yeah, building a lot of apps there. So um, by example, Mm, we use Webflow for our website. Um, I think that is pretty common already. Mm -hmm. So we use Make for all sorts of automation, like automated um, blog post content, uh, automated uh, YouTube video podcast descriptions, uh, stuff like that. Um, we use Airtable a lot for internal databases. Um, we enrich our leads with, um, by example, when we have an email address and find that at LinkedIn, then we enrich the lead like with the um, how, what is the company, how many, how many um, people are working in this company, uh, why is it based and in, in which industry is it working and so on. Um, so make is quite a big thing uh, in at Visual Makers. Um, then we use uh, Bubble and WeWeb and Xano um, for our customer projects mostly. So Bubble and Xano we use as a front end and uh, Bubble and WeWeb we use as a front end and Xano uh, as, a, as a back end because mm -hmm. it's more scalable than completely visual uh, visual databases. Um, so yeah, usually when people start at our company, it's like, oh, wow, you use a lot of tools. <laughs> Eat your own dog food, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite important. And if somebody from the audience is now confused by all the different tools uh, Lidit mentioned, I have a great recommendation. You go to visualmakers.de slash tools, and there is a tool directory where you list all the important tools you need to know, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so let's step over to myth number two. Um, I think this is the very German myth. So no code is insecure, especially when it comes to data protection or GDPR. Uh, yes, that's, a, that's quite a big myth, uh, which is um, it depends on the tool. Uh, I would say, because um, here we have the same principles that go for any SaaS tool that you want to have in your company, except for the ones that where you where you want to export the code and host it on your own servers, right? That's also possible. So um, in most no-code tools get enterprise ready right now, and that means uh, GDPR and data protection laws and certifications for, for all that are in place. Um, but of course, there are tools like that are uh, just popping out and, and completely new where you have to look, okay, like what are they doing with my data and so on. So that's, uh, that's for sure. And you have to rely on the providers to, to have measurements to be secure, right? So um, the big tools have that, that, that is like, because it's like one of the biggest myths um, in, in no code, every no code tool is making sure and that it has that this uh, that it gets this right. Mm -hmm. And speaking of uh, databases, we mentioned this already, some tools also allow that you uh, basically host it by yourself. 
So you Post can it make by it... yourself or have a private cloud or have it uh, on on servers uh, near your location. Like in, in Frankfurt, most are hosted. Um, some are in, in for some tools you can you can really choose. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Then let's step over to myth number three, which is basically the main question we are talking about all the time. So no code is only for developer uh, is only for non developers, <laughs> like people from marketing, sales, and product. Maybe I have one to uh, one comment to the myth before uh, yeah, sure. the else uh, because we have we actually had a podcast guest uh, from a company in Berlin who's doing um, a teleclinic they are called and mm -hmm. they they have a lot of um, um, how you say uh, health data mm -hmm. like yeah. really really sensible data and even they managed to automate a lot of their processes uh, with uh, tools like Make. Um, they have their own instance and so on, right? But um, so even for industries like that, uh, no code is is still applicable. And I think this is one of the most sensitive data you can come across. Yes. Right? Yes. Next to to bank and uh, data and so on. Yeah, financial yeah. data. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Myth number three: um, No code is only for non-developers. Yeah, I think we, we already covered that uh, quite yeah. a lot. So um, no code is another tool in the engineer's toolbox. Uh, and it can really be leveraged to be more efficient, to be faster. You don't have to code everything yourself. Um, and sometimes it, it really, really makes sense also depending on who uses um, the the API or the process or or so in the end, um, it can really make sense also for for non developers. And actually, I mean, you mentioned like you love no code and you are a developer yourself. So so what are your reasons? I mean, I just love to have simple solutions for yeah. maybe complex problems. And while I really like to build something by myself, I don't see the point building something that was built already and that works fine mm. for my use case. So um, I can more um, uh, focus on the situations where there is no no code or low code tool available. This is the time where I can basically dive deep coding um, and do it on my own. But for all the other cases, and this is most of the time the case, I have no code tools um, I can basically take advantage of. And yeah. th this is great. So I would just recommend and emphasize all the developers get into this and um, yeah, have a look at all the tools that are available. I basically, I just, before we did this stream here, I checked out your tool directory and um, I set a counter and I think I had over 10 tools that I already used or I'm still using. So um, yeah, I can just emphasize on this, all the de developers, engineers, data experts out there, have a look at the tools and uh, try to find out what uh, basically yeah can save you a lot of time. Yeah. Do you have an example for what you use uh, in no code? Um, so one thing that was an experience that we never published, but that was really nice working together was Notion in comparison with Super. If you have, mm. if you want to have a nice website, it's more like a low code solution because you want to adjust the styling that matches your needs, but this was super impressive. Uh, you don't need a CMS necessarily or um, like a WordPress or Airtable in the background. You can basically just use your um, your knowledge base from Notion and make a really nice website out of it. Um, so yeah. this was one of my favorite ones, to be honest. Yeah, cool. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> um, all right. Myth number four. And this is something you mentioned before already. Um, so no code does not scale. It really depends on the tool. No code can scale. Um, so by example, we're building one one tool for one of the biggest universities in, in Germany right now with no code. And uh, that needs to be pretty stable. Uh, so it has to scale in some way, right? So. Um, and there are various other examples where you where you have apps on no code uh, that that actually scale. Uh, by example, there was um, a few years ago there was this game Fortnite, um, uh, really uh, really public, and one guy built um, an app where you where you can buy skins 
for your mm -hmm. characters uh, in the game. Um, and he has he had like, I don't know, 5 million people on the website or so uh, at, at one point. It, was, it really went uh, viral um, and it didn't break. So it scaled also there. Um, so it, it really depends on a tool. Everything that's really visual and really easy to use doesn't scale as easily as the, the more scalable solutions where we are more in the low code, um, mm -hmm. low code area. But I would also ask every time I build something new is um, what do I need? Does it really need to be super scalable or is it more important that I'm faster in the beginning? Mm -hmm. um, or who is going to use this? Are, do we really going to have like, I don't know, 5 million people at once uh, on, on my app? Um, so and if the answer is no, then it's not the question about like, how scalable is it? And also, if you build something new, then you have to iterate so many times, and you and you still can kind of build it really modular, right? So um, you you don't have to say I built in code or no code, but you can start with no code, and then kind of switch different modules in mm -hmm. in the time that you need them, right? Um, so I would say it's more a user problem than a tech problem uh, that yeah. no code does does not scale and i think you mentioned something very important we engineers sometimes get lost in non-functional requirements such as mm. scalability because we want to do everything right we learned it at the university or somewhere and we want to do everything right from the first from the get-go and the problem is we're making us a hard life um making all the ticks right away and as you mentioned, um, is it important to be extremely or indefinitely scalable right from the beginning? Probably not, because you're starting anyway with a better face or with a small audience and basically grow um, steadily. But yeah, it, it's very important, not just for scalability, but also for other non-functional requirements that we often put onto the table, but they're not necessarily needed right in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, let's go to the last one. Myth number five. No code produces shadow IT or aka chaos. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, because I would say no, no code produces shadow IT. <laughs> um, because, you know, the world that we are living right now, right? Where you have access to all these tools. Somebody in the company will know about these tools and will say like, okay, and I just want to have it fast and and probably dirty. So I'm going to just, just use my own tools and build something. So that happened in the 90s with Excel and Access databases, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say if you don't provide your employees with the right tools in a kind of secure way where you have something... I know there are different concepts for this, like citizen development or we have like a center of excellence and then kind of spread out citizen developers in the different departments or you have, you know, the different models for this. But it, basically, there are the same principles that go for for coding as well, right? You need a mm -hmm. good documentation. Um, you need... Um, um, how to say, uh, I, I forgot the word right now, but like that every name is is the same, like from webhooks and APIs, like how you name things, um, naming like conventions. Consistent, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Conventions. Do you need conventions to, mm -hmm. you know, you need a system where you say like, okay, this is how we agree to work together. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you kind of create a playground in which people are... Um, you know, are able to 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 move quite freely. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that, or honestly, think that not using no code produces more shadow IT than mm -hmm. using no code in a in a conceptual way uh, does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's a very interesting point of view. I never thought about that, but it totally makes sense. Um, I mean, people should have the right tools to get their job done. And um, yes. it shouldn't matter in the end if it's like code, custom solution, a solution from somebody else or no code tool. 
Yeah. And if, I mean, if somebody's afraid kind of of using no code tools or, or kind of enabling uh, people uh, in their company, then starting with a really not business critical mm -hmm. process or app or so um, is really helpful. By example, we have lots of sales teams who build their own customer portals and, and so on um, and kind of who access the main tool or the main solution with the with an API and so on, mm -hmm. but they're totally free in their customer portal solution or other automation uh, examples, by example, for HR, when you have a new, a new employee and you want to onboard them and not the, hello, nice that you're here onboarding, mm -hmm. but the you need an account here and here and here and as access to decent at a document, when you automate that, um, that's something really not business critical where people can't really break things and where you, you have the space kind of to explore things. Then from there, you can really grow into, into an automation first or, or a no code first company. I think that's also something that you can extend far beyond no code. Um, so if you, if it's about generative AI, if it's about yeah. any new tooling, um, start experimenting with it on the non business critical stuff. Uh, maybe make an internal hackathon or make an event out of it. Get people basically hands on and um, get your first insights and experiences. And then you can decide, okay, is it feasible to do something business critical with this at some point in time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, great. So it's also helpful for the developers we are aiming right now. Um, if you have a side business, a side hustle or like a side project, have a look at no code tools, um, try it out. Maybe they can save some time or save you some complexity. And um, as you said, Lilit, you can also integrate that with your tooling, with your code tools, with your APIs. So it's just Lego building blocks that you can connect in any way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's really fun uh, to build with it. So it's definitely worth uh, giving it a try. And. One additional thing, especially when we're talking about developers, I find it's not that different to what all the uh, cloud uh, or hyperscalers are actually offering. If you look at AWS and Azure and uh, Google Cloud, they have, for example, tools where you have uh, text to speech. You give an audio file in, you get like transcript out and you have like hundreds of small services. And these are all just Lego building blocks that you somehow put together. And I think it's kind of the same with no code tools. Yeah, and it's not about, it's also, I mean, all these, how you build is always kind of the the means and it's not the end. So right. all these like no code, code and low code are all means to an end. Like, because what we wanna build is we wanna build great products. We wanna, we wanna build solutions for problems that exist. We wanna automate things. We wanna build more efficient and so on. So it's, I think it's really important to keep in mind that it's not about, okay, you have to build with code or no code, but like, mm -hmm. what is the right technology or tool for, for the project? Yeah. And Sarah has a nice summary. Um, let me share this. She said, we realize technology itself doesn't create value most of the time. That's right. I mean, we're all about technology and diving into the latest tech, but that itself is not creating value. The value comes from simplifying processes or creating real benefits for users. If you want to learn the latest web framework, of course, no code won't be your first choice. But usually, and I think this is now uh, this is now cut off. Um, I think it's this a... shouldn't be your yeah. argument when starting a new software project. Right. Very true. Exactly. All right. If I look at the time, it's all almost uh, one hour. <laughs> so um, Lilith, we come to an end for this stream. Would you like to uh, give the audience some final advice? Uh, it, 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 well, I can I can kind of repeat myself. Like, yeah. um, it's really, really worth it to, to have a look at NOCA tools. Um, it can be a great addition um, to your tool stack um, and, and can be used in various ways. And it might surprise you what is actually um uh, already working with with no code i would like to underline that at least three <laughs> times <laughs> so <laughs> please have a look at the no code tools it's great um thank you lilith 
for um, yeah sharing your insights and having the time here. Um, it was great to have you here and get um, all the insights and especially the myth busting. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. Thank you so much. All right, um, everybody, have a great day and see you next time. Bye. Bye. -bye.